Hello everyone, I'm Joe Pryweller, Conference Director for Rubber and Plastics News. Welcome to Rubber and Plastics News Ask the Experts series at the International Silicone Conference. This live stream series is your opportunity to engage with professionals on the current business environment and to interact with questions. Today's Ask the Expert is hosted by Shinetsu. Our speaker is Eric Bishop, North America Marketing Manager with Shinetsu Silicones of America. Eric will review technical advancements in self-adhesive liquid silicone rubber that will increase productivity and expand the library of compatible thermoplastic resins. He will answer your questions after the presentation. To submit a question, email rpnevents at crane.com, or if you're watching along on Rubber and Plastics News, LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube sites, submit your questions through those platforms. With that, I will turn things over to Eric Bishop of Shinetsu. Eric, the floor is yours. Thanks, Joe. I really appreciate the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the International Silicon Conference. Welcome to our Ask the Expert from Shinetsu. Uh, as Joe said, I'm Eric Bishop. I'm the North American Marketing Manager for Shinetsu. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, I've been with Shinetsu for 17 years. Prior to that, I worked for what was then GE Silicones for seven years. So uh, approaching a quarter century in the silicone industry. So. I appreciate you tuning in today, and uh, I, I hope this is a productive use of your time. So let's let's begin. Oh, sorry. Okay, so um, uh, as far as agenda goes, uh, I'll give you just a few slides on Shinetsu. Uh, some of you, you know, believe it or not, may not be familiar with Shinetsu. Um, you know, being a Japanese company, we don't have uh, the same brand recognition as some of our competitors in the U.S. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what you know. What are selective adhesive limbs? Uh, give you some uh, uh, background on the capabilities of our limbs technical center. Uh, actually, introduce the new products and then discuss applications. And then I will finish with uh, an exciting announcement. So, next slide, please. So, Shinetsu has been in business uh, since 1926. So, we're coming up on a, a thousand, a hundred years uh, as a company. Uh, we started out as a fertilizer company. Uh, we have 23,000 employees, and last year sales were $14 billion. Next slide. Uh, in addition to silicone, we're also the number one uh, supplier of PVC resin globally. Uh, we're the number one supplier of uh, semiconductor silicon wafers for the semiconductor industry. Uh, we also get involved in things like cellulose products and rare earth magnets. Next, please. As I said, we're not a household name, but from a market cap standpoint, uh, we are we compare quite favorably with other big companies, big chemical companies like DuPont, Dow, BASF, and Bayer. So we have a re lot of resources to bring to bear for you and your projects. Next, please. One aspect of Shinetsu that I'm particularly proud of is uh, we're a very stable company. As I said, uh, we've been in business for uh, 94 years. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we really have been a fairly stable company and we're very proud uh, that our credit rating uh, has been upgraded since 2007 to an AA3 rating, which is uh, higher than all the chemical companies on this page. And it's just a testimony to Shinetsu's conservative nature and uh, our financial responsibility. So we're, we're, we're not going anywhere. We've had no reorganizations. We've had no acquisitions. Um, you know, we're the same company that we were when we first founded Silicon. Go ahead. Next slide, please. And with that, and Shinetsu was one of the first companies to manufacture and commercialize silicone in 1953. So that's 67 years. Uh, our, our, we have 5,000 different products that we manufacture. And last year, our sales were in silicone alone were $2 billion. Next, please. And we're also quite proud of our technology. Uh, Shinetsu is a specialty chemical company. Um, you know, we're not uh, we're not looking for the the commodity business. Uh, we were trying to bring solutions to our customers, and you can see this evidence by the increase in patents uh, in, in the United States uh, over the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, one of those patents was actually for uh, selective self adhesive silicones. So let's let's look into that now. Next slide, please. So what are select adhesive limbs? Uh, it's, you know, it, it's a merging of selective self-adhesive 
Uh, they chemically bond to substrates, plastic substrates in the mold. Uh, however, they bond selectively to specific resins. Uh, and you'll see, we'll talk about different products that bond to different types of thermoplastic resins. Uh, we're trying to get, uh, and we do succeed typically in getting what we call 100% cohesive failure. So if you can see this uh, graphic here on the right, uh, you can see that this is a lap shear test and you've got uh, two pieces of plastic with silicone bonded between them. And then we pull that in an instron. Uh, if we see the silicone still bonded to the plastic, then what has actually happened is that the silicone has torn apart, has ripped rather than delaminating from the plastic. And we find that that's a, a better indication of bond strength uh, in addition to the, the force that it would take to pull those two apart. And as I mentioned, uh, these products were introduced in, in 2014 uh, actually, and so we've uh, had had these on the market for over six years. Go ahead. So, how did we develop selectesive limbs? So, the uh, initially, our, our, we had two key objectives. Uh, one was to develop a product that would bond aggressively to plastics uh, without adhering to the mold steel, of course. And second, we had it to we had to have a cure in less than a minute, so that would be suitable for injection molding. Um, historically, LSRs don't bond to things. So uh, as you can see in the table here, NG stands for no good. So LSR typically in a mold doesn't bond to metals nor plastics. Uh, Shinetsu has extensive history in sil silicone adhesives, RTV adhesives and sealants. And we can make uh, those products bond very well, quite aggressively to both plastics and metals. So the objective was, how do we get a product that does not bond to metals, but will bond to plastics? And if we can do so, it'll be suitable for both insert injection molding as well as two-shot injection molding. Next slide, please. So this is done through chemistry, of course. So we have proprietary adhesion promoters that are added to the silicone uh, that give you a very strong bond between the silicone and the thermoplastic, but a, a weak interaction within the, between the silicone and the mold. Uh, you know, there, there is some attraction there, and, uh, but ultimately when the mold is opening, it's essentially a, a tug of war and the silicone is staying with the plastic. Uh, but it is, you know, that, that uh, interaction with the mold steel does need to be addressed. So uh, as an aside, I have some tips for you. Next slide, please. So for those of you who are molding uh, self-adhesive limbs in, in your presses, uh, here's, a, here's a few pointers for you, and these are the things that, that we've learned through our experience. First of all, you need to make sure that the mold temperatures are hot enough, uh, meaning that uh, even though your set point might be, let's say, 130C, uh, your actual mold steel could be as low as you know, 100, 110, 120 degrees C. Uh, more importantly, if you have the mold open for quite a while because you're demolding, then that's going to drop those temperatures as well. So it's important to get uh, as, as reproducible process as possible so that you have even intervals and mold open so that you can plan for that. But it's, it's absolutely critical to use a, a pyrometer to actually test the temperature at the mold surface. Uh, minimum mold temperature, minimum steel temperature for our products is 120C or approximately 250F. And that's, again, that's between the silicone and the plastic. And silicone is a, a very good thermal insulator, as, as most of you know. So you're going to have to be a little bit hotter than that. And that's why typically we see mold temperatures more at 130C or 266F uh, for polycarbonate. And that's getting to be about the limit that you can overmold polycarbonate without having some deformation. Um, beyond having the temperatures hot enough, you, we, there are also some tricks that you can use, some mold, external mold releases that can be employed uh, when you're first getting started with a, a new steel. And brand new molds or molds that have been uh, modified or recut uh, present particular problems. And that's when you would want to use this stuff. Because what you're trying to do is get, the, there's a certain seasoning that happens with the mold steel. The, the silicone actually has silicone volatiles and oils that will impregnate the mold steel, much like a cast iron skillet. But when you clean it or you machine it, obviously you're removing all that seasoning. So you need to re-season it. Until you get that rebuilt, you go with, you know, some options are a, a 10 to 1 soap and water solution, uh, just, you know, uh, era, you know, just a soap, uh, either uh, like a detergent of some sort. Uh, there's a, a product from McLube, uh, number 1711, that uh, works pretty well. And then there's also a, a product called Cami A1000 dry lubricant that can be applied and basically baked on to the, to the mold. Um, or you can also try seasoning with a general purpose material. Uh, we would recommend 
one of our KEG 2000 products. But once you get up to about 50 or 100 shots, either with the KEG 2000 or with a, a self-adhesive material, you will start to build up that seasoning. So just uh, some tips, and uh, I know this presentation will be available afterwards, so hopefully you can refer to it. Next slide, please. So we, how do we how do we test how do we quantify this uh, adhesive strength? So we have a 90 degree peel adhesion tool in our mold in our uh, press in Akron, Ohio. Uh, we then we overmold that with a, a, a legitimate injection molding process. Uh, we pull that in an Instron and we develop a stress strain curve. Next slide. And this is all done in our Limbs Technical Center in Akron. Uh, we are headquartered in Akron, and uh, we have a, a building dedicated to uh, Limbs uh, support where we can do startup, we do training, uh, we're doing our own uh, mold trials on our own materials. You know, this is an example of that work, uh, and it's uh, available for our customers uh, as well as for our internal production. Next, please. In the technical center, we have uh, two uh, uh, full-scale injection molding machines. We have uh, an Arberg all-rounder, all-electric machine. Uh, it's 110 ton with a 35 millimeter screw. Next. We also have an Arberg. It's a hydraulic machine with a, a tie bar list uh, C-frame, uh, 60 ton machine, uh, also with a 35 millimeter screw. So these are full-size production pieces of equipment, uh, not just simply laboratory scale. Next, please. Uh, but beyond the equipment that we have, you know, uh, it sounds trite, but uh, our greatest assets are actually our uh, limbs process engineers that we employ. Uh, we're blessed to have uh, two guys that uh, come to us now for almost two years, uh, Kevin Barbie and Robert Javingo, uh, who combined have over 50 years of experience in LSR molding, uh, with processing, tooling, uh, putting facilities together, uh, and even R&D work. Um, they've worked for some of the leading companies in Northeast Ohio, like QSR, Forest City, and Robin Industries. So uh, they're a, a, real, a real strength of Shinetsu, and uh, I think it helps differentiate us. Next, please. So let's talk about select adhesive limbs now. So uh, looking at the traditional products, so we have had uh, KE2090 series, and uh, again, that, that was introduced just as I came to Shinetsu. So 2004 is when we uh, had that on the market. So it's been in, in market, in applications for uh, over 16 years, uh, medical products, uh, consumer products, uh, industrial products. Um, so it has a, a wide range of application, uh, bonds well to polycarbonate, PBT, PPO, uh, crystalline resins. Uh, it's available in uh, shore A hardnesses from as low as five to 70, and it has been tested for biocompatibility, both uh, USP class six, and some grades have also been tested for ISO 10993. Uh, six years ago, we introduced uh, X344172. Uh, this was to bond to uh, nylon 12 primarily for a uh, like a non-BPA uh, uh, application. Uh, it's available in a 40 shore, and it's also been tested for ISO 10993. So that's the that's our current lineup. And uh, now without further ado, I'll introduce to you some of the new products that we're excited to uh, uh, bring out. Go ahead, please. So the new select piece of limbs are two that I'm gonna talk about today. First is uh, KE2098. Uh, I'll show you it has a, a very wide, uh, a broad uh, base of application on a variety of uh, thermoplastic resins. Uh, it's currently available in uh, 40, 50, and 60 Shore A, and it has also been tested for USB Class 6 compliance. Uh, we, did, we did just test the 40 Shore. Uh, we feel that the, uh, the, the lowest hardness is the worst case scenario from a biocompatibility standpoint. So for now, we've tested just that, and that gives us confidence that the, the 50 and the 60 would pass if we tested those. Uh, secondly is the uh, X30, X34-4178, which is our, our low temp curing uh, LSR. Uh, is designed to bond to polycarbonate, so it's uh, very similar to our KE2090. Uh, it's currently uh, been developed in both a 40 and a 70 shore, and uh, is a, a low temperature cure material, and it's also been tested for USP Class 6 compliance. Next, please. So KE2098, you can see, uh, and, and we can, of course, we can share this data with you, but uh, this just shows you a snapshot 
of some of the testing that we've done recently on a wide variety of nylon materials, uh, nylon 6, nylon 6.6, six, uh, polyether imid, uh, peak, and uh, we, we get generally get very good adhesion. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the CF stands for cohesive failure, so that would be indicated by the, uh, the, the blue numbers here in the right-hand column. Uh, the pink numbers are for adhesive failure, but still pretty strong adhesion strength. So in some applications, uh, you know, you don't necessarily need the strongest bond. You just need something to stay together uh, during assembly or until it is assembled, like a gasket, for example. So you, you may not need cohesive failure. You may just need it to stay on so that when it's being assembled or shipped, that the, the gasket or the seal is staying in place. So we found with, again, with KE 2098, that we have a very uh, broad adhesion to a variety of thermoplastic resins. Next, please. Uh, and again, it's available in 40, 50, and 60 shore. Uh, it's, it's, you know, because of the nylon nature, it's, it's more tailored to automotive and industrial applications, uh, but we have tested it for biocompatibility, so it could be suitable for healthcare applications as well. Next, please. Now we'll transition to our low temperature curing material. Uh, again, this is X34-4178. That's a 40 shore material. And you can see we tested here, in this case, we tested on uh, a good, a good cross-section of uh, polycarbonate-like resins. Um, APEC is a material from Covestro. It's a high temperature polycarbonate. So we we're actually able to uh, mold at up to 150 degrees C and get a very good bond out of the mold. Uh, the Macrolon is a typical polycarbonate. And uh, again, we got very good adhesion to that material. And these are at shorter cure times than you would have with our you know, traditional KE2090. And then finally, we even tried to Triton, which uh, if any of you have uh, worked with it, understand that it uh, has a very low HDT, uh, and therefore it's you know, almost impossible to run at, you know, at the higher temperatures. Even, even 130C, we're starting to get deformation. But we were able to get pretty good bond. For, to run Triton, you really need to be maybe 110 at the most, or possibly 100 degrees C. Next slide, please. I apologize, this is a, a little bit small on, on your screen and mine, I think, but uh, if, if you look, uh, what you're seeing here is a comparison of uh, cure times versus uh, temperature. So this is the, the new low temperature curing material. This is the KE2090-40. And you can see here at uh, 100 C, uh, we're about half the cycle time, half the cure time. And the, the colors indicate uh, what, what we're doing is trying to cure. Uh, we, had, we had an evaluation, evaluation point of under cured, cured, or fully cured. So, of course, we were trying to get to fully cured. And this was with a, uh, a 40 thousandths cross section. So, again, you can see at, at 100 C, we're about half the time of the KE2090. At 120 C, we're down, we're about a, a third of the time of KE2090. So it's a, a real significantly uh, you know, faster cure, uh, significantly shorter cure time. And, and this, le this leads to obvious benefits. Next slide. So with this low temp cure material, again, you know, uh, from a, a, a property standpoint, it bonds well to polycarbonate, triton, other crystalline resins available in a 40, 40 and 70 shore, has been tested for biocompatibility. But the real opportunities are, are two, really. Either one, you can cure at lower temperatures, such as 100 C, at a, at a reasonable cure time for things like Triton, PCABS, maybe even polypropylene, maybe a, a talc-filled polypropylene, perhaps. You know, something where we really haven't been able to get into some of these olefin resins in the past uh, and have been limited to just engineering grades. Uh, this could open up a whole new window for our industry. Uh, the other option is to, you know, if, you, if you're at the same temperatures, uh, traditional temperatures, then you're going to cure a lot faster. So at 130 C, uh, you can see that we were reducing uh, cure times by anywhere from 50 to 67 uh, percent. And that can help with minimizing capital expenditure. If you can mold in less time, then instead of needing two cells, you might be able to get the job done with one cell. So that can be literally hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of dollars of savings just from cycle time. Next, please. And applications for select adhesive limbs are many. Um, you know, everything from respiratory masks to needle-free connectors, uh, any type of a housing that needs a seal, whether it be a, 
a cell phone or a, an ankle monitor or a, a handheld device to be used out in the field, like an industrial device, uh, gasketing, any type of gasketing around you know, headlamps or emergency vehicles, uh, soft touch tips, um, you know, it's, it's any, anywhere that you could use silicone, uh, you've, you've now eliminated an assembly step and in, increased the process and made it generally a much leaner process. Next, please. So one announcement I want to share with you is that uh, assuming that there is a uh, NPE in 2021, and we're, we're cautiously optimistic that there will be, um, I, I, to be candid, I'd say it's maybe a 50-50 proposition, but uh, we're moving forward as if there will be. Uh, we will actually be uh, showcasing uh, this product at the NPE in our booth uh, in a partnership with uh, these, these partners, ACH, Arberg, Fluid Automation, Covestro, and Crycolor, and we'll be actually making a, a pet bowl. So uh, please, uh, you know, stop by, visit us, I hope, and uh, get, get a pet bowl for your pet. And then I have one other announcement, which is even more exciting. Please, next slide. So I'm announcing that uh, Shinetsu Silicones of America will be starting limbs production in the United States. Uh, we have completed production and uh, construction of a 35,000 square foot facility in our Akron, Ohio headquarters, uh, right on our campus. Um, construction is completed. Uh, we will be commencing with manufacturing in 2021. And uh, initially we'll be bringing over uh, uh, new uh, uh, localizing products that are now being manufactured in Thailand or Japan or China. Um, and then eventually, once we get uh, those all localized, we'll actually start doing our own new product development. So we anticipate that this will be a real uh, opportunity for us and our customers uh, with shorter lead times, uh, you know, and, and, and quicker response in terms of uh, product development because we'll have local people who are working on it. So uh, it's, a, it's been a, a long time coming. It's been something that uh, we've been working for for over a decade to justify the business. And uh, we're excited to uh, be able to announce it today. Next slide, please. And that's what I have for you today. So uh, I really thank you for your attention. Again, uh, I hope that uh, it was a constructive use of your time. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. Uh, Joe, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Steve. Great presentation. And I want to remind people that if you'd like to ask a question, you can submit them by emailing rpnevents at crane.com. Or if you're watching along on LinkedIn, YouTube, or Facebook, submit your questions through those platforms. Steve, you made a lot of announcements today, uh, uh, a lot going on. I, 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 know, I know the most important is the pet bowl at MPE, but we don't have to talk about that so much. Uh, but let's talk about the new the new uh, LIMS uh, production center to opening in Akron. Can you tell us a little bit about why you decided to uh, shift production or add production here in the, in, in the United States and in North America? Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, you know, Shinetsu, uh, you know, perhaps it has been a limitation that all of our uh, liquid silicon rubber production has been in Asia. Uh, Japan initially, uh, more recently Thailand, and uh, in the last decade in China. Um, you know, fantastic facilities, and, and we've done a fine job of handling that supply chain, but uh, our customers have always asked for us to have a more local supply chain. And uh, so we, really it was just a matter of, of justifying the business and diversifying our supply base um, for customers who are looking to have you know two uh, sites that could potentially manufacture the same product from a risk mitigation standpoint uh, we'll have that now and for our business in north america again we'll be we'll have local production so you know what might have been you know uh, 12 week lead times uh, could now be shortened to you know four to eight week lead times so that's just going to help uh, you know, reduce the supply chain and make us more responsive to our customers Excellent. Are, are you going to be producing an entire library of, uh, of uh, select piece of limbs products at this uh, facility? Yes, yeah, that's a fair question, Joe. I, you know, we're certainly prioritizing the, the bigger volume runners right now across the board. Um, okay. some, some niche products uh, might stay where they're at, candidly. Excellent. Well, a couple of questions have come in via email. Um, um, Eric, how do, you how do you test or qualify adhesion out of the mold? Uh, the person is asking, "What's the, that's 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 the first question? Here. How do you test or qualify adhesion out of the mold?" Well, I um, so right out of the mold. I mean, I mean, these guys have pretty pretty well calibrated fingers, and they're pretty strong. So, I mean, if 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 it's going to pull off right at the mold, 
uh, it, it usually just pulls off and there's absolutely no uh, cohesive failure. It sometimes it just it just rips off. It just pulls uh, off. Now, an eyeball test in that case. Eh? Yeah, and, and again, that's just the 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 initial test, and then of course we do you know test it in the in the instron and actually you know get the pull data. But you can tell a lot right out of the mold for sure. Excellent. Uh, what's the shelf life of introduced uh, Shinetsu Select adhesive technology? Uh, shelf life for these products is it's just like all of our other uh, uh, Select adhesive materials. Uh, it's uh, six months from the date that we ship it to our local customer. So if you're a, a U.S. customer and we're shipping from either California or Akron, uh, it's six months from the date of our shipment. Okay. Uh, how can I get a specific thermoplastic resin tested for adhesion? Great question. So, I mean, as I said, we've got the Limbs Technical Center. What we do uh, today is we get plaques from uh, resin suppliers. Uh, they have to be basically between 100 and 120 thousandths, uh, could be as low as 90 thousandths, but there's a, there's a range in which we can accommodate different thicknesses. Uh, and then we cut them to size and use those as the coupon. Um, but it usually starts with your resin supplier. But we are, we are more than happy to test uh, materials uh, if they're not in the library right now. Uh, our whole goal is to expand that library and uh, and make it available to our customers uh, through self-service. That's something that we'll be introducing, uh, you know, or in the first half of next year is the ability to actually go onto the website and actually search and actually pull some of that data or at least view some of that data to see the, the real quantification of the bond and not just whether it was, you know, compatible or not. Are there certain materials this works better with than others or, um, or others that, that you need to test still with some of this? Yeah, there are there are a whole lot of uh, resins out there, and you know, I mean, in, in the world of polycarbonate, we have a really high batting average. You know, I mean, I can only think of a, a, maybe a, a few exceptions where we haven't been able to bond to polycarbonate. But when you get into things like nylons or uh, you know nylon twelves or some of the polyether imids, you know, one one nylon six is very different from another nylon six, and some have you know glass filled or not glass filled, uh, carbon filled. So I mean, it's really best. Uh, if you if you as a as an end user or as a uh, as a fabricator have a resin that you, that you know is specified, uh, let's go ahead and test that, even if it's similar to another one that we may have already tested. Excellent, and uh, I know polycarbonate. You mentioned the thirty four four one seven eight, and uh, sounds like with the with with the curing times and uh, and and uh, and fast cure, it's going to be. Quite, is, that, is, that, is that quite revolutionary for the industry? Or are we going to bring about some needed change of polycarbonate curing? Yeah, I mean, to be candid, some of the curing times today can be in excess of you know one or two minutes, and uh, and that's just not a very lean process. So uh, we're we're hopeful that with these materials, we can get that down to something that's uh, you know uh, more more typical of an automated process and, and obviously re reduce the need for multiple molds, multiple presses, and, and, and reduce that whole uh, work in progress. Certainly, it affects cycle times quite a bit too, it sounds like. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, cure time is the biggest component of cycle time for LSR molding, for sure. For, for sure. Um, do you ever have issues with the silicone sticking to the mold itself? Um, you mentioned some some tips, I know, in, in your presentation, but... Yeah. Uh, are there other issues? Um, no, I mean, it, it is a reality and it has to be addressed. And particularly with brand new molds, brand new steel, I mean, they, it really, you know, the products do like to, you know, adhere. Um, I mean, you can pull them apart, but, you know, it's it's definitely wise to go through some type of a seasoning process through one of the, you know, one of the many options that I listed before. But it's, it's especially for people who are getting new into uh, you know, self-adhesive molding, uh, I, I would recommend, you know, re relying on people who have experience, you know, like, like Shinetsu. Excellent. Here's a question that came in via YouTube. Uh, what kind of cure chemistries are you using for the adhesive cure? Are you addition, add addition condensation, con yeah, condensation, any of that? To yeah, good, good question. So um, universally, uh, LSR, liquid silicone rubber, we call it LIMS, it's our trade name is all addition curing. It's platinum addition curing. Uh, and then, you know, the, the adhesion promoters are proprietary, uh, but that's that's what gives you the bond. But the actual cross-linking reaction is a, a standard uh, platinum addition cross-linking reaction. Okay, great. Uh, do you offer any on-site on processing support uh, for some of these products? 
You bet. And, uh, you know, in, in a non-COVID year, you know, we, we'd be there in, in a heartbeat. Um, you know, we, we have actually visited customers uh, since March uh, for certain occasions. Um, obviously, we're trying to be very careful with our own employees as well as our customers' employees. So we're trying to do as much as we can remotely if possible. But in, in, in this world, uh, there's, just so, there's just so little you can do uh, on a screen like this when you're talking about an injection molding machine. So, um, yeah, we are, we're being careful, but uh, we are available to visit. And of course, you know, once, once we get past this as a nation, uh, absolutely. That's why, we, that's why we have two guys in our technical center, because uh, in the past when we had just one, uh, if that person was traveling, they had to literally shut down the whole technical center in order to go and visit a customer and then come back and start it all up again. So with two, we're actually able to keep things working, keep things moving in the technical center, even while one of one of us is traveling. Just curious as a general question, has COVID affected the use of LSR? You talked about it for some medical applications and other things. Uh, has this been a, has this been a sort of a unique year that's uh, that's helped expand the use of LSR? Uh, you know, no one yes. So you know, uh, LSR is widely used in, in automotive applications, True. and you know, when those when those plants were shut down. You know the supply chain came to a halt. Uh, however, uh, as as a lot of my uh, partners in the industry, you know, like tool makers, uh, you know, pump suppliers will attest. Um, you know, COVID was a real opportunity in the healthcare world, especially with trying to ramp up production of ventilators. Uh, we had a lot of customers who were buying molds, buying presses, buying material. Uh, so it was a real boom for some of our customers, and it really helped to uh, diversify our business and help us get through. So you know, overall. LSR has done is done well, better than some of the other businesses within within the silicone portfolio. That's excellent, uh, Eric. We're running out of time. I wanted to ask you if you any any final comments that you want to mention you want to share with our audience today. Well, again, you know, as as uh, as one of the organizers, uh, co-organizers of the conference, uh, along with uh, Greg Duell from Bacher, um, you know, we certainly just uh, appreciate everybody's attendance. Uh, we know that this was uh, kind of a roller coaster. We should have been meeting in, in Cuyahoga Falls in May, and then we were hoping to meet in person in November, and now we're virtual. But, uh, you know, thus far, I think it's working really well. And, and, you know, judging by the registration, I think it's it's still an opportunity for us to connect. And, uh, you know, we look forward to 2022 uh, when we'll be able to do this in person again. But thank yeah, you. exactly. This is just a unique year, but uh, it's been great for attendance and lots of great content at the at the conference itself. So uh, kudos for that. Yeah. So, but thank I, I want to again thank thank Eric Bishop of Shinetsu Silicones of America for taking us through some of the recent advancements in self adhesive liquid silicone rubber and some of the products, and also also talking about the uh, new limbs production that's going to be going on in Akron. If you have additional questions, please feel free to reach out directly to Eric through his email address listed on the screen below. I also want to thank you for watching our Rubber and Plastics News Ask the Expert series at the International Silicone Conference. As a reminder, you can join us at 2 p.m. today to hear Laura Berenger of Philips Respironics discuss the use of silicone in respiratory therapy medical devices. And then our last session today will be held at 4 p.m. and will feature Matthew Heidecker of Plastic Service Network presenting on VOCs and LSR, testing and the balance of processing. The conference will continue with a full agenda tomorrow and Thursday, so stay tuned for a lot more. And be sure to join us again tomorrow at noon Eastern time for another Ask the Expert session with Steve Hersey of Hexpol and on Thursday with Norm Riley of Bakker. All conference sessions and Ask the Expert live streams will be available to registered attendees on rubbernews.com. That's rubbernews.com after the conference is completed. I'm Joe Pryweller with Rubber and Plastics News. See you soon at our next Ask the Expert session.